Welcome to the American Academy of Sleep Medicine Presidential Town Hall Forum with Academy President Dr. Cannon Ramar. Today's topic of discussion is COVID-19 in sleep medicine. I'm Thomas Heffern, the Academy's Senior Director of Communications and Marketing, and I thank you for joining us today for this live webinar. Joining Dr. Ramar for this forum are two panelists. Dr. Indira Guru Bhagavatula, Chair of the Academy's COVID-19 Task Force, and Dr. Thomas Spear, Chair of the Academy's Advocacy Committee. This forum will include time for live questions and answers, so I encourage you to use the Q&A button to submit your questions in the webinar platform or respond to as many questions as time allows. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available as a free member resource on the Academy website at aasm.org. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Academy President, Dr. Cannon Ramar. He is a sleep medicine physician at the Center for Sleep Medicine and a professor of medicine in the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Welcome, Dr. Ramar. Appreciate it, Thomas. Thank you very much. And thank you all for uh, joining this forum and really appreciate you taking the time to be here as well. Uh, I'm, I was going to go through a few slides and uh, the three main things hopefully I want to accomplish in this particular forum. One is to give you a quick uh, review of the COVID-19 pulse survey results that you all had a chance to fill out. Second, I want to make sure that you're all aware of some of the ASM initiatives that have been taken so far, so, you, so at least you have a feel for what's, uh, what the ASM has done. And third, most importantly, I want to make sure we have enough time to hear from you in terms of what's going on, what's going well, what's not going well, what questions that you have, what is it that the ASM can do to help out. And so that's where I would love to make sure we give enough time for you to ask those questions. And, and I'm so glad that I'm joined today by uh, two well-known panelists, both Dr. Guru Bhagavatula as well as Dr. Spear, who will will be able to guide us through some of these things and look at the next steps that we need to be doing as we all work together to see what needs to be done to, uh, to surmount this pandemic and look at the next steps that needs to be taken. So with that, let me start talking about some of the ASM initiatives that have taken place. And as you can see, there are multiple of them that's, uh, that's happened so far and many more to come. And uh, to start off with, let me just highlight a few things out here. I'll start off with the new COVID-19 task force and Dr. Guru Bhagavatala is the one who's chairing that task force. She and the task force members have been doing a fabulous job in bringing out things to benefit our members. And that includes FAQs, looking at a summary of the CDC recommendations and making sure it's tailored towards the practice of sleep medicine and many other things that I'm pretty sure she'd be happy to highlight further. Similarly, we created a new telemedicine presidential committee that's actually headed by our past president, Dr. Doug Kirsch. And, and thanks to his leadership, along with the committee members, again, a lot of uh, initiatives have been, are currently being taken, including uh, the use of telemedicine videos and free lecture series that are gonna be available for members. In addition to that, you can see that the ASM put out a self-care webinar, a health policy and legislation webinar, and hopefully a few more of those to come in the near future. Some of you, if not hopefully most of you, might be aware by now that the ASM has decided to waive the membership dues for 2021 for the ASM accredited sleep facilities. And, uh, and this is just a start of hopefully many more initiatives to come and we at the board as well as uh, the ASM leadership, uh, both uh, Dr. Steve Van Hout, who is the executive director, along with the senior staff are looking at next steps that we can do to help our members uh, during this particular situation that we are in at this point. And a few other initiatives that I just wanted to quickly highlight include a three month uh, free subscription uh, for ASM Sleep ISR, which has been extended, along with the free three-month member access to ASM Sleep TM Select Telemedicine System. Similarly, the, the board approved moving forward in providing COVID-19 relief funds for state and regional sleep societies, which we thought was important to offer, both from an educational course perspective in terms of what the uh, regional and state sleep societies have been doing, and, and also to help our members through that particular process. Similarly, the foundation, the ASM Foundation has provided uh, relief funds for uh, investigators 
uh, for current award recipients uh, during this particular pandemic. Similarly, uh, the ASM Foundation President, Dr. Anita Shalgekar, along with the, uh, the board members are looking at next steps in terms of what is it that we can do of, in terms of RFAs related to post-COVID-19 sleep disorders that will very likely be becoming more prevalent in the near future too. So more to come on that as well. This is uh, something that we wanted to share with you and this is, uh, as Thomas mentioned, will be available for you. These are some of the key links that we think would be very helpful for our members. As you can see, the first one is on dedicated email for member questions. Feel free to use those and it quickly gets triaged to the right person so that we at the ASM are able to answer and take care of your concerns and questions that you might have. Similarly, there's a web link for COVID-19 resources and that's listed out here, including a dedicated email for coding and reimbursement. As you very well probably are experiencing some questions or concerns related to that, feel free to use this. Ms. Dietra Gray, along with uh, her other staff members are staffing it. And so they'll be happy to get back to you uh, with the answers that might help to clarify some of the questions you might have. Similarly, there's a link for telemedicine codes, something that hopefully most of you are using. And if not, this is something that you may want to check in uh, from a link perspective to see how this might help you uh, as you look at different codes that needs to be used uh, during uh, the use of the telemedicine platform. So now let me dive a little bit into the, the Pulse survey results that, we con uh, that, that was conducted. And just to clarify, this survey was done over a two week period as a way for ASM to figure out what is it that our members are going through during this particular pandemic? And how is it that we at the ASM can then help our members uh, during this particular situation? And this survey period was for a two week period between July 27 and August 9th. And as you can see, uh, we surveyed all, uh, the survey was sent to all our members, 8,835 members. And uh, similar to the previous survey responses, it, it, we got a 6% response for, for this particular survey. And I'll touch upon the results here in the next few slides. I'll start off with the clinical demographics. And this includes the clinical background, work setting, state country, and some COVID specific questions as going to be shown here. I'll start off with the clinical background. And as you can see, almost 50% of the respondents were physicians, followed by sleep technologists, nurse practitioners, respiratory therapists, physician assistants, and psychologists. There was a 15% other category that's not listed out here on this particular slide. And that 15% included sleep center staff, coordinators, managers, and supervisors. To answer, so the question is, uh, where were the respondents from and what type of practice were they doing? And as you can see, uh, the 33% were solo or group practice, 20, almost 30% were academic hospital or health system. Th that's the location that they were practicing in. 28% were non-academic hospital or health system. The others were a VA or within the uh, health maintenance organization. If we were to break down who or uh, what constituted within the solo or group practice, solo practice constituted about 12% within that 33% number. The group practice was 11% and independent medical group was around 10%. This is uh, showing where the practice location of the respondents were. 44% were urban, 39% suburban, and 18% rural. Uh, this is based on the region. And you can see most of the respondents were from the Southeast, followed by the Great Lakes region, the Middle East, Far East, and so on that's listed out here. The other includes some of our international members and that constituted about 4%. If you look at the answer to the question related to the changes in patient volume in the last month, 65% felt our saw that there was a decrease in uh, number of patients that they saw. Interestingly, 16% reported seeing more patients, whether that's related to HSAT expansion or virtual visits, it's not, it's not clear. 18% reported no change. If you look at uh, the concern about the ability of practice or facility to remain financially, 
financially solvent through 2020. This is where I have a significant concern when I look at this particular response here, and you can see 46% responded that they had concerns, while 42 said they had no concerns. And this is a huge number, and we need to make sure that we at the ASM are doing what we can to help our members through this pandemic. And if you look at the practice facility that's applied for financial assistance due to COVID-19, 36% said that they have applied, 40% said no, and 25% don't know. If you look at the post-pandemic utilization of telemedicine, if telemedicine were to be reimbursed, 62% felt that they're gonna be using telemedicine more than before, while 10% uh, said less than before the pandemic, and, and then 12% said that it's gonna be similar to what they've been doing so far prior to the pandemic. So these are the open-ended questions, and this is where we really got a lot of information in terms of what the members were feeling and going through at this point. So I just wanna take a couple of minutes to go through some of these open-ended questions and the answers that we received here. So let, let me start off with the first one. And the question was, what are the one to two ways that COVID-19 has had an impact on your practice or facility? And as you can see, 30% said uh, closures and reductions. So one of the things that I wanted to quickly emphasize here, though we got a lot of responses, which was great to see, and some of the responses were more than, or one, each respondent might have responded to more than one. And so that's why you see a little discrepancy in terms of the respondents to the total responses. And the other important point is, despite the number of responses that we received, it, interestingly, they all fit into a particular theme, and that's why we categorized it into these themes that's listed out here, with 29% uh, being closures and reductions, and that included lab closures, reduced testing, ceasing titration studies, and reduced hours of work or operation. 23% were ch challenges in practice, and this includes PPE costs, cleaning procedures, and associated costs related to that. 20% said a decrease in patient volumes. 13% uh, talked about uh, telemedicine or telehealth implementation. 8% talked about physician and staff shortages, and that this included a reduction of staff, furloughs, new COVID-19 related hospital responsibilities as well, where maybe some other physicians were being tapped into to help out with coverage in the ICU and so on and so forth. And these are just some of the sample comments that, that I've listed out here. And you can see we shut down our lab for three months, referrals are down, more than most same day cancellations, no shows. And you can see the other uh, comments listed out there. So the second open-ended question was, what are the one to two strategies that have helped your practice or facility to adapt during this pandemic. And it wasn't surprising, but it's also good to see that 45% said telehealth implementation, height side expansion or APAP expansion was 16%. 11% talked about infection control protocols. And, uh, and this included screening at the check-in, masks, PPE use, disposables, social distancing. And the telehealth implementation included both virtual as well as uh, phone visits too. In terms of changes in operation, that included staff furloughs, layoffs, flexibility in hours, office closures, additional training, or no intake of simple cases. And you can see the other responses out here. And these are some of the sample comments, this, which includes increased use of telemedicine, video and telephone visits, curbside headset pickup, and you can see the other comments that have been listed as sample items there. And the third open-ended question was, how can the ASM help you and your practice facility? And here you can see uh, advocacy comes to the top, and that's why we invited Dr. Spear to join us today, who chairs our uh, advocacy committee. And, um, and this included issues related to reimbursement, telemedicine reimbursement, including phone encounters. ASM guidelines occupy about 30%, and that included uh, things related to practice and lab reopening, CPAP and HITSAT guidelines. COVID testing and mitigation guidelines were something that the uh, members were 
requesting that the ASM look into infection control guidelines and safety uh, staff safety guidelines. And some of these have already been addressed, and that's another reason for inviting our COVID-19 task force chair, Dr. Guru Bhagavatula, to help answer some of these questions. And if there are still issues that are not necessarily clarified, I'm pretty sure she'll be able to take it back to the task force to iron out these issues moving forward. And these are some of the sample comments that you listed here. And um, I just want to finish up by quickly talking about the current priorities that's high on our list. And, and, and from a board perspective, we really are looking at additional ways to support our members. And for us to be able to do that, we really need to make sure we are hearing from you. And that's very important. And, and, and I think you, you see my uh, email listed out here, which is kramr at asm.org. So please uh, make sure that you take an up, uh, please take this opportunity to send me an email, let me know what's going on, uh, what is it that we can do at the ASM to help out. I think this is gonna be hugely helpful as we look at the next steps that we need to be taking uh, to help our members during this current pandemic. Another big priority for us at the ASM is the health policy and advocacy. And we're asking to, uh, CMS to make telemedicine waivers permanent. We're working through various different organizations, including the AMA, as well as through some of our advocacy efforts to make sure that this happens. And you can also take action, by the way. Please go to this web link that's listed out here as a way to uh, be involved and engaged, because the more of us who are involved and engaged, more likely we're going to create that impact in um, making this as a permanent uh, waiver, telemedicine waiver that's going to benefit us. Similarly, I think uh, what we are focusing on, focusing on is the feedback to CMS on the proposed physician fee schedule, as well as preparing members for changes uh, in 2021 to the ENM office visit codes. The telemedicine presidential committee uh, under Doug, uh, Dr. <laughs> Doug Kirsch's leadership is also developing a lot of telemedicine resources for members, which you should be hopefully receiving here pretty soon too. The payer policy review committee has been putting a lot of efforts in asking private payers to cover telemedicine as well. And this is, these are, though these are our priorities, there are other initiatives that we are looking at, but I think some of these initiatives takes priorities based on what we end up hearing from you. And that's where we wanted to make sure we provided this opportunity to, to listen to what you have to say so that we can look at the next steps that needs to be taken to help you out here. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna invite Dr. Guru Bhagavatula as well as Dr. Spear to join me in this panel so that we can start hearing from you and answering any questions or concerns that you might have. And I'm gonna hand this back to, Dr., uh, to Mr. Thomas Heffron so that he can moderate the questions that hopefully you're starting to fill out both on the Q&A as well as on the chat box. With that, I'll stop sharing and hand it back to you, Thomas. Thank you, Dr. Marr, for this presentation. We have received some questions already. I want to encourage our live attendees to use the Q&A button in the webinar platform to submit your questions now for this Q&A time. Um, I think we'll start with Dr. Guru Bhagavatula. Um, you've been uh, involved through our Public Safety Committee and now our COVID-19 Task Force and, and helping the Academy uh, provide advisories for our members over the last few months. Uh, it's been quite a whirlwind for the last six months in particular and just want curious about what your general thoughts are, especially as we look through those comments and the responses from our member survey about the, the variety of challenges that our members are facing right now. What, what's your just initial reaction to the challenges that all uh, sleep medicine professionals are facing today due to COVID-19. Sorry, I was muted. Um, we're actually very impressed with the response of our community in, in being resilient and in responding to the needs of our patients during the pandemic. 
um, judging by the numbers of practices that have very deftly and quickly moved to telemedicine and moved to alternative care delivery models that incorporate increased use of home sleep apnea testing, uh, use of automatically adjusting positive airway pressure therapy instead of requiring in-lab titrations, using clinical judgment, um, and you know, doing everything in their power to mitigate transmission risk to patients and, and among staff. Um, and we're also very aware that there are a lot of logistical challenges um, and financial challenges that all of our, uh, our communities are facing. Um, so, and we're doing all of this in an environment where uh, the science that could inform us is, is limited in many areas. Um, so what we are hoping to do on the task force is really use expert consensus to provide as much guidance as possible, but we're also looking for crowdsourcing some solutions. Um, so if there are aspects of care um, that, you, that some of our practices have worked out, we want to host these sessions as a way for people to also share what they're learning. Um, the recommendations that we put up uh, went up on March 17th, uh, within six days after the World Health Organization declared this a pandemic. We had our first set of recommendations up. Um, and then we modified them on April 17th when labs in the Northeast were starting to reopen after the initial spike in COVID-19 activity. And then recently on August 27th, we set up another set of recommendations. Um, and we tried to make it accessible and easy for everyone to use. So I'm just going to encourage everybody to just go to the ASM website and take a look at what's there. There's a wealth of information. Um, we have We've compiled all the frequently asked questions onto one page. And so if you have a question, there's a good chance somebody has already asked it. And if they haven't, then um, go ahead and submit those to us. Um, we have another page where we've summarized what the CDC has recommended. And they have a very, very uh, detailed, thorough series of pages that can be hard to navigate. So what we did was pull out all the information that's relevant for our members, and we summarized it for you for your convenience. And then we have a third tab um, that includes uh, specific strategies inside sleep medicine um, based on consensus, based on some um, evidence, and, um, uh, and just experiential information. Um, on how to manage your lab, what do you do about COVID-19 pre-testing, um, some approaches for telemedicine, uh, how to mitigate risk in the lab, how to handle PAP titrations, and so forth. So there's lots of detail available for everyone there. Dr. Spear, we obviously see in the survey results that uh, advocacy issues are a top priority for our members as well. What are your, your general thoughts about the need for greater advocacy during this time? It's critical uh, to do more advocacy. We've been actively involved this year in trying to get more involved, not only in uh, the issues of telemedicine, but uh, one thing to keep in mind is uh, we've been working on for um, more than two years is uh, the Sleep um, Health Caucus, which is we're about ready to be kicked off where we will all have a form in Congress to uh, be able to uh, advance our interests, uh, many of these things with reimbursement, uh, many things with regard to our role in healthcare, and just get our Congress, uh, our representatives, uh, to be aware of the vital aspect of sleep. That has become to the forefront in uh, the COVID uh, pandemic, and I think uh, Congress is interested. It hasn't been the best uh, period of time to hold their attention, but it, it is, oh, we're rolling along very well. It's also interested in talking to members uh, or listening more so than talking to CMS and others uh, that the issue of telemedicine is very much of interest to them to keep it going, to keep using it. Uh, the use of uh, just a telephone, which is available today, whether that'll last, it, it's hard to say. One of the key issues that I keep running into is documentation. If you use it and your medical record needs to document it, why you used it, to whom you used it, uh, and why it was chosen over um, using video, I, it just will support it. It was interesting. I was in a meeting with Brad Smith, who is the director of CMMI, which is uh, officially the um, 
Oh, it's uh, anyway the, for innovation in uh, Medicare and Medicaid. And he, it, to whittle down his long presentation, if we don't start using these aspects of telemedicine, uh, using telephone, other access, um, uh, using the home as an excellent place for healthcare, uh, some of those uh, available resources will not be available to us because they say we're not using them. I found that an interesting way of presenting it to us, but he is available. He's new into that position and reaching out to him. We're reaching out through Congress more than anything else. It's hard to get access. Seeing increase in reimbursement, it seems like um, a very difficult process. The issue was stark. We tried earlier, uh, end of last year, and seeing the modernization, that hasn't been finalized. Uh, but be aware of um, value-based care uh, is now active, and there, there's a big carrot in that to see changes in reimbursement. Um, it does challenge the use of fee-for-service. Uh, and so COVID is being an excellent resource for them to see how it works. So I think uh, those are the areas of advocacy that we're working on. And again, uh, directing you to the ASM website, there's an advocacy page and you can put in your zip code send a uh, letter to your representative that these are issues that you're interested in. I can't emphasize more that if you respond to your representative as a constituent, that works. And that's what we want everyone to be able to do. And if you do, if, if you ask them to say, we want you to join the Sleep Health Caucus, that helps us because we're following up on all those and make that go forward. Dr. Gerber got the tool that we're receiving some questions about COVID-19 testing, and I know that's been a, a, a difficult issue uh, throughout this pandemic. So the CDC uh, does say that it is an option, but then it, there's also a lot of concerns due to lack of availability, slow turnaround times, uh, potential for false negative, false positive results. So um, what, what are your yeah. thoughts right now about the, the current status of COVID testing and the role it potentially has in, uh, in sleep medicine? Yeah, exactly what you said. I think that if you can get it and you can get it in a timely way, it's accessible, it's paid for, it's, it's not a bad thing to do. Um, particularly in areas where there is a high or a rising prevalence um, and among patients where you suspect they may have it because of symptoms. Um, so uh, the, the issue is um, we were testing, for example, in our lab on all the diagnostic studies before people were coming in, but very quickly it led to a, a bottleneck. Um, and when turnaround times start to exceed two to three days, then the test becomes less helpful. So if seven to 10 days have to, have to pass before you know the result, then the test becomes meaningless because the patient could have had a re-exposure. So if you have access to it, it's, it's affordable or paid for or covered and, um, and you can get it, then, then the CDC recommends it is a good thing to do. Um, you also have to look at the context. It's probably more critical uh, before doing an in-lab PAP titration than it is during a diagnostic study. Um, so there are just a lot of different local factors to consider. No lab is exactly like every other lab. So it's going to be important to tailor your decision to test or not based on uh, where you are, what's happening with local activity, um, what symptoms is your patient experiencing, and what's the accessibility of the test. If you do get a negative test, it's really important to interpret it with caution. Um, in areas where there is high prevalence, a negative test could be a false negative, so you may have to repeat it. Um, and then even fal uh, false positives are known as well um, in, in low prevalence areas um, or in patients who are just recovering from illness um, and continue to have positive tests, but they're not actually infectious. And in fact, the CDC's changed their recommendations so that for milder disease, you don't have to retest at the end as long as their symptoms have resolved and sufficient time has passed. And so yeah, it's not a quick yes or no answer. Um, and our guidance documents do go through some of this detail. So I encourage everybody to just check it out um, and read. There is information under the FAQ section, under the CDC section, and then the, uh, the tailored response for um, sleep centers. 
We're also getting questions, uh, as you might expect, about PAP titrations. So, uh, you know, in our new summary of the, the CDC recommendations, it makes it clear there that CDC is not prohibiting aerosol generating procedures right now, as long as appropriate PPE is used. Um, but as you've been in contact with other um, sleep physicians and sleep facilities, what, what's the feedback you're getting? Have most uh, labs begun uh, doing PAP titrations again? Or is there still a lot of hesitancy there? What is the landscape looking like? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So it looks like, I mean, in, in areas of the country where cases are rising or, or peaking, uh, those are probably areas that are still holding off on PAP titrations, but uh, other areas that have seen a resolution of their peaks and a declining activity in the last two weeks, um, they have resumed PAP titrations. Um, and what we're hearing is that uh, technologists are using N95 masks and face shields. Um, and they're in the room, they're not in the room when the PAP is being administered. They go in to do the setup and they leave and all of the adjustments are done remotely. So it's literally one, one trip in and then one trip out and they minimize contact. Um, and then terminal cleaning of the room is done after the patient leaves. Speaking of terminal cleaning, that's another question that we have. Um, uh, you know, what, what are the recommendations currently for, uh, for cleaning as far as reusable devices? number one, and then number two for the, the room that's used for the sleep study itself. Uh, what's what's the, the current recommendations coming from the CDC in those situations? Um, yeah, so the uh, there are no specific recommendations for sleep study equipment per se, but there are general recommendations for health uh, equipment. Um, and what we've done is just sort of uh, surveyed membership and, and gotten feedback from various labs as to what they're doing. Uh, regarding home testing devices. So um, some labs were, most people agreed to minimize face-to-face -face contact time in the interest of social distancing. And so what they're doing is using uh, mail out and mail retrieval models. So some, some uh, facilities were doing this. The problem has been that it introduced long delays because of mail delivery and again, created a bottleneck because in lab volumes were down, a lot of those patients were being switched over to home studies. So those bottlenecks have been addressed by using curbside drop-off and pickup to shorten the, uh, the amount of time that the machine is out of service. Um, some labs are also introducing a 72-hour wait time between uses. So they take the recorder out of service. And that's based on a study that was reported in The Lancet that the, um, the virus can survive on plastic surfaces for up to three days. Um, so that data needs to be taken with a grain of salt because even though the virus was isolated, actual disease transmission has not been shown. But these practices and recommendations are being done in the interest of the public health and in the interest of doing no harm and protecting people from uh, transmission. So it's just erring on the side of caution. So taking it out of service for 72 hours has been you know, in practice for some labs. And just because there are areas of the device that just can't be cleaned, they just can't be reached. Even if some components are disposable, we can do our best job at, at cleaning what we have uh, using the uh, EPA rated cleaners that the CDC recommends, but, and, and that the manufacturers recommend. Um, but because there are those areas that can't be reached, people are keeping them out of service when available. Um, and as far as cleaning rooms, uh, those, uh, uh, instructions are well outlined. I would recommend everyone take a look at our um, our website under the CDC recommendations for facilities. Uh, there's specific cleaners that are EPA approved um, that should be used in that process. Now just remember that because CPAP is an aerosol generating procedure that uh, a more thorough cleaning is likely required because if the patient is potentially infected and we know that a lot of transmission is happening among patients before uh, they show any symptoms um, or while they're completely asymptomatic and that the majority of transmission happens that way and that they could be testing negative and, and still be infectious. So after a PAP titration, just realize that the more CPAP you use, the greater the likelihood that any dispersion that happened could have gone for a longer distance. So surfaces you wouldn't think of cleaning, you know, 
unlike doorknobs or tabletops, you know, even the walls and ceilings and, and higher points of contact, the virus potentially could have been dispersed to a wider uh, target area. So the cleaning needs to be considerably more thorough. Um, and again, these are uh, things to consider. We don't have prescriptive recommendations based on science because we just don't have that data. Dr. Sapir, we're also getting uh, questions here about reimbursement related issues, and that was one of the themes that we saw in the survey results as well. I know you're also a longtime accreditation site visitor, so you visited sleep centers in various places across the country, a variety of settings. So uh, any thoughts you have about the, just the financial challenges that sleep centers are facing right now? how reimbursement issues are related to that and, uh, and, and need to continue advocating in those areas? I think we need to continue to advocate. Uh, the chances of seeing any significant change in the short term is not very good, uh, just because uh, they're looking at efficiencies and looking at value, not volume, which we're in, in the volume business in the sense that we're a very growing uh, field in that we're finding more and more patients that have uh, sleep disorders and therefore no matter the better we do the more we see and CMS sees an increase of utilization so we're, we're between a rock and a hard place at some times but I think that we're seeing some improved uh, efficiencies uh, and so therein lies some of our benefits uh, that we can do more with uh, less um, that's not what people want to hear. Uh, I think the Holmes um, study, there has been some recent studies that say there's some profitability with regards to the amount of staffing that needs to do more of those, but the reimbursement per home study is uh, relatively low, that hard to find much profit there to maintain a staff. But the issue for me is, again, looking at your patient population, not only what new patients you have, but the patients that you've had in the past. Look at um, being proactive and following up of many of your older patients that may have stopped using PAP therapy because of their afraid of the aerialization due to their family members. And maybe they've gone months and maybe they need to be recontacted. Maybe there's more that we can do for those patients. Uh, and so reimbursement for uh, telemedicine uh, is, is fairly stable at the moment. Again, well, I don't see that going down nor away, but if we don't utilize it in, in an effective documented way, uh, I think we're going to uh, see some changes. It's, our experience has been that if we challenge uh, how we do it to get more money, uh, it doesn't work that way. But what works is that we document what we're doing and the amount of time it takes. You know, our, the more efficient we get at moving throughput helps us. And, and then the, the, I think the clinical skill set that we bring to the patient, you know, other than just testing, other than just are you utilizing your PAP device, starting to look at the mental health aspect, looking at, you know, there's a lot of fear currently going on out there not only for the caregivers, but also for the patients. Should I continue to use my device? Should I, you know, what is, if you, th we can provide that. And I think that it's not only just the difficulty in initiating, maintaining sleep that we commonly refer to insomnia. You don't have to think that you're a CBTI expert. You just need to let them know that those difficulties may be due to some of their anxieties and some of their worries about their sleep problem, we can extend our caregiving to them and that resource will be, and revenue generation from that care will help us move forward. And I think that the more we broaden our diagnostic categories in your, in your program and as an accreditation site visitor, you see, and we know that 85 to 95% of all patients that go through a facility is sleep disorder breathing. We need to broaden that out, even though many of the other ones don't seem to be paid at the same um, rate, if you will. The, the test of a PSG is much better than an HST. We know that. But clinical skills and, and getting parity and getting extenders involved, and there's a lot of movement in that area. 
Uh, we just have to work on looking at the codes. And I think uh, looking at the coding that the ASM has looked at, uh, there's a lot of uh, behavioral codes. There's a lot of site codes that are, are useful, but you have to be attentive to what diagnostic codes you use and things of that sort. All that is resourced in um, the ASM website. Um, it may be very new to your building people to utilize them, uh, but become acquainted with them. And I think then we become the full service center that we purport to be. And um, I think that there lies our reimbursement opportunities. It's hard work, but there's our opportunity. Uh, the wearables and the reading of that information, the more you document that you read them, that the physician was involved in the reading of them, and how that was reported on the chart is critical because they are going to look to see how much time was taken to do that. And uh, that's where the reimbursement is determined. And value-based care is going to wrap all that together and they're gonna look at that. So be conscious of it, be aware of it, and it's gonna be very valuable to our moving forward with all the technologies that's available to us. I have an in interesting question here about whether or not the pandemic has had any impact on prior authorization. So one of our members is seeing fewer denials for in-lab sleep studies right now. I'm curious if, if any of you have heard similar reports or experienced uh, that yourself, whether you've seen any difference in prior authorization over the last few months. I would say that it's the pre-auths are, are still a stumbling block for most programs. And there's a lot of activity trying to substantiate that. And what I hear is the, from the other side of the, that is the inadequate documentation as to why the test or why the treatment modality is being requested. And sometimes you have to go back to the referring uh, documentation is not adequate. And uh, that's, that's a problem. And, um, and I think what we've in the academy, at least as I've seen, is the sleep team has to get more involved in making sure that documentation clarifies all that. And that's not only the, the director, medical director, the sleep physician, it's all members of the team have to be conscious of that and how that plays out. When you look at where the payments are going to come from uh, and where it's already in place in many organizations now, they don't ask who does it and who gets paid. They get one fee. It's kind of a bundled concept. And uh, then the questions of the all the who does what is not necessarily as important as does the work and the value and does the patient get the outcome they're looking for. Uh, that's kind of a I don't know, I don't necessarily like the answer, but uh, I think that involves the, the technologists, involves the uh, PA, the NP, uh, everyone in, in the team. And the more we see the team concept as a viable reimbursable moment, the more successful we'll be. I'm not sure that the uh, pre-authorization, uh, I don't think we have a, a data at this point to know that Thomas in terms of whether pre-authorization numbers are lower than before, but one could speculate that that could be the case just based on the fact that we do more height stats than before than going with PSG. So that's a possibility. Uh, but, um, uh, but in terms of whether the actual numbers are lower, uh, uh, I, I, I don't have the answer, but at the same time, uh, it's very likely to be the case. And whether that's going to change in the near future is going to be interesting to see, particularly with, uh, uh, particularly if the number of uh, PSG in lab PSGs and the titration studies starts uh, gets, gets to start ramping up here. The, whether that's going to change the perception, at least, will be interesting to follow through. Well, the pandemic has obviously been a challenge for access to care. There's uh, some concern expressed in the questions here about quality of care as well. So particularly uh, greater involvement of third-party DME companies in uh, providing PAP care and even HSAT care as well, uh, maybe potentially reducing the involvement in the hands-on role of the sleep medicine professionals in the sleep center. So I'm curious if 
if any of you have concerns about current trends in, uh, in quality of care. Yeah, I can start off and then see if Dr. Gurubhag of the land, Dr. Spear have anything to add to that too. Uh, I think that's an important question. And I, I think I would look at this as an opportunity in the sense that uh, we, we are doing what we are doing based on our current situation, which means um, uh, it, this provides us an opportunity to study that further. And, um, and, uh, and I think we have almost six months data right now uh, uh, because it started sometime in late February, March. And, and so we have some data at least to start uh, looking into this closely to see what's been the outcome thus far. Uh, so I, I think looking into this a little further uh, by studying it, I think it's going to be important. Um, the, the second point I just wanted to make also is related to going back to the foundation, having some uh, RFAs related to, um, uh, related to this particular area, looking at outcomes, quality of care, based on what we are currently doing, it's going to be important to, uh, uh, to get some more studies in this particular area as well. Uh, so I think uh, I, I would, even though we are practicing the way we are, this is an opportunity to figure out what, what is actually going well, uh, what else can we do to improve quality of care would become pretty important too. I don't know, Indra or Tom, do you have anything? I don't have anything else to add other than what you said. Um, Anything from you, Tom? Yeah, I would, I would a, echo what you said. And I, I think it's a grand opportunity. We do know that home sleep studies when in the past, let's say, two to five years, the outcome of CPAP users who have had minimal contact with the sleep facility or the technologist or the education don't do as well. Their outcomes are poor. So, but when you go through a sleep lab program where we used to do two night protocols or split night protocols, you had a lot more education, a lot more hands on. We know that works better. What I'm proposing, if you're in a situation where you're doing more home studies, getting involved in the process from the very beginning and supporting them, take a proactive position, identify those who may need more help. You just know by social determinants certain populations are gonna need more help. Offer them the help, initiate it. There may not be a reimbursement on day one, but the more you get them involved, the better you will do. The, if you see yourself in competition with the DME, you're not. They don't have the expertise, but we have oftentimes, if you will, yielded to them because we were seeing new patients all the time. And we didn't have time to see them at six months, a year, two years. If we did, that's all we'd do. We didn't have the time nor the resources. Now it seems like we're trying to, if we will, welcome these people back into the process. And we have technology that we didn't have years ago when I first started. So I think that this is an opportunity to gather that back and establish that the sleep facility, the sleep physician, the practice, the solo practice, you can use all kinds of resources now to gather that back in because until we get the quality there, because we have the opportunity and we have the expertise and the technologists and, you know, are a vital part of that. They may not be as busy at night now, but, you know, here's an opportunity to do more, but it's hard to make that transition. And will hospitals or labs be able to have the resources to pay for them? Well, I think we all got to step up. That's where we were talking about earlier. I think from the perspective and the advocacy, there's this issue of parity. There's issue if it's under the su adequate supervision and there's documentation of what you do and how you do it and who's looking over that. And there's collaboration. There's a there's better chance in the future that will be taken care of. I mean, uh, in psychology, you have psychosociates can do the same work and get reimbursement. There's a lot of things that can be added to a program uh, that uh, is reimbursable currently. So I, I'm optimistic. We just have to change the way we look at it since I think uh, there's a lot of patients out there that we need to uh, see and, and maintain their health, their sleep health, and, uh, and that includes the mental health aspect as well. 
Well, that leads into another question. Uh, you know, there've been lots of reports about uh, increase in COVID insomnia during the pandemic, people having a variety of sleep issues and insomnia. And so one of our uh, attendees is asking about how we can better involve clinical psychologists um, in, uh, in sleep centers, promoting CBTI as, a, as an effective treatment for insomnia, and then making sure that patients are referred to, um, to CBTI specialists. So any thoughts about the, the role of clinical psychologists in the sleep field going forward? I think there's a critical role. I've been doing it for 30 years. So as a clinical psychologist in training, I've done a little bit of everything, but I agree. And what is the opportune now, which has been fascinating, is with telehealth and telepsychology, as they would like to call it, you can get a CBTI trained individual who is associated with knowing the sleep and the expertise in insomnia. And now with some of the states now, with at least in Texas where I'm at, you can get a special application to be able to cross state lines. How long that will last, uh, there's a lot of effort to be able to do that. So there is, you have the capability, you know, there's organizations within the AASM and there's also a special psychology group that's um, independent that are from the Behavioral Sleep Medicine Society that will reach out and do that. It's just not a good communication, but you can tap someone who then you could refer to and they, are, they, are, they will do the, they will be just uh, adjunctive to your organization. And there's been a great deal of conversation to add that distinction to an accredited program that uh, they have to have that available. And that way, they can spend the three to six different sessions they need. They can make it available. It's a reimbursable moment um, for most, but it is not that expensive when it comes down to the actual cost out of pocket, if you depend on how you look at it. But it's integrated, can be integrated with any sleep program, whether you're a two-bed lab or you're a 10-bed lab. And uh, I think there's a host of psychologists that are up and ready to start today. So how do yeah. you get in touch with them? Uh, check with uh, the ASM for that um, list of psychologists. Um, and then there's others. And um, through the ASM, you know, if you're looking for one, I'm, I know there's people that have lists that would be interested. So uh, I strongly encourage that. And um, I think we have a committee chair that does that. And that's, uh, I can't pick his name off the top of my head right at the moment. Yeah, I think um, I agree with everything Dr. Spears said. I think there's an expanded role right now for clinical psychologists in sleep medicine, um, definitely in relation to COVID-related insomnia symptoms and so forth. But the other piece of this is that I think that care uh, was more seamless and integrated when we we're providing things in person. So just from my own experience in our facilities, you know, having a face-to-face -face visit with a patient you tell them their diagnosis, you tell them what the risks are, you tell them what the benefits of therapy are, and then they go right next door and have a face-to-face -face visit where somebody reinforces the message and they go home and start using therapy that very night. That sends a very different message about the urgency of treatment and the importance of adherence than having a telephone or a, tele a video visit and then at some point, you know, the, the asynchronous nature uh, uh, of these visits, that, that your visit may be at one point in time, uh, the DME provider is at another point in time, the psychologist is at another point in time. I think all of that sends a different message of urgency and importance to our patients. So um, I think that there's more of a role for ongoing support, not just for cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia, but also for motivational enhancement and for cognitive behavior therapy around non-adherence with CPAP. Um, and perhaps some of the nightmares and, and managing, maybe imagery rehearsal therapy, they're recurrent. Imagery. But I think there are a lot of roles that are unexplored. And I think the role of the psychologist is gonna expand greatly um, as this plays out. I agree, and it, and it does very, you see this very robustly in the pediatric programs. Yeah. I think this really re emphasizes the point about sleep team uh, concept, yes. which the ASM has been pushing forth for a while. Uh, I, I think uh, we touched upon the psychologist role, and I think the same applies to the other providers who are part of that sleep team who needs to provide this uh, 
uh, encompassing care for taking care of the whole patient uh, from a sleep need perspective. And, uh, and, and I think this, uh, again, if we were to look at this more from an opportunity perspective, uh, the barriers, if we were to convert them into opportunities, this might maybe make us to work a little differently. But at the same time, uh, this provides us an opportunity to relook at what, what, how do we best accomplish that in a way to overcome the barriers, but yet serve the patients that we need to take care of. And, and the sleep team concept, again, plays nicely into that in terms of making sure that we can incorporate them as we look at the next steps they do. I think uh, I, I want to add, Conan, to what you, uh, the discussion earlier about the splintering of the diagnostic piece from the ongoing care management where diagnostic tests are being performed potentially by a DME provider and, um, and the clinical evaluations are happening separately from that. I think that sort of disintegration of the decision-making process can have real um, quality effects in the quality of the outcomes for our patients. Um, it's tough to evaluate somebody and make clinical decisions when all you have is, an, is a number, an AHI, and you don't have access to the raw data and the ability to see what actually happened. Um, so I think that uh, in the in best interest of patients, integrating all of it and the, the decision making, the testing, the, um, the follow-up care needs to be done seamlessly and in a team environment rather than fracturing and splintering the, uh, the process. Uh. I can't support that more. And after early on in the field, that's the way we did it. And it, it became fragmented, uh, limited people, I guess, but it, that's what works. And when I visit uh, sleep facilities around the country, those that have all those people in one place, it's amazing how efficient and how positive the people respond to it. I, I agree. Uh, and that's what I think when we advocate uh, in Congress, when we advocate in a lot of places, that's what we're talking about. And that's, you know, how does sleep fit into the overall healthcare system? And it's a major role. It's not a minor role, but we integrate with, you know, what do you do when you have to cross over into the hospital? We fit there too. <laughs> yeah. And I think that we're just in, inf in our infancy in gaining proficiency around leveraging all the great things that telemedicine platforms can offer us. Um, so just thinking out of the box, if it was possible for a clinician to meet with a patient, do their initial instruction, you know, reviewing the diagnosis and so forth, and then move them right into another telemedicine room where they then, then speak with, you know, the respiratory therapist or the clinical psychologist or whoever it is, where that team-based um, infrastructure is still present and the patient still experiences it as a, as a team, um, rather than it's on them to schedule the next visit and the next visit and the next visit. We also have to think about the burden on our patients uh, with getting onboarded with telemedicine platforms and then continuing to access care in this type of environment. Some of them are not used to this. Uh, it's new for them. So as much as possible, the easier we make it and the more seamless we make the transitions between team members, um, I think the better they'll do overlay, uh, uh, overall. But obviously we need science as well to help direct which protocols would work best. And I agree. And, and, and I think that if, and, and as we've spoken of already, that um, there's a lot of, you can test out. If you don't believe that an APAP titration is, is worth its salt and you want to go into the lab, compare the two. You're going to get a chance to bring some of these people back and see how well the equipment that you thought was good, that one of the manufacturers said it was ideal, maybe your titration protocol was not effective. Uh, you know, ask yourself, what is an APAP failure titration? <laughs> Write it down. What's a failure of a home sleep test? I mean, the uh, insurance company will tell you to redo it if it fails, but I mean, you, it costs as much to do a failure as it does to do a, a positive one. So I think we have to take the time and effort to compare the two in our own individual facilities. You don't have to have a perfect scientific double blind study, but the thing is you can say we did 15 of these and 15 of that, and this is what we did. We broke it down to this type of patient doesn't work in our environment. I mean, if you're at 7,000 feet, you can do one thing versus what I could do here in Houston at 40 feet. And uh, so you have to be very conscious of your environment you have to be conscious of your patient population. 
uh, when I was visiting uh, facilities in New York City, that's a very different environment uh, when you look at the different populations from the Bronx uh, uh, to other places. So you have to be very conscious of those things. And that's where I think the team environment plays a critical role. And that's what I think we're advocating. Um, and I think even though the accreditation standards could be strict, but uh, I think we're trying to make them uh, user friendly and they're not like they used to be anyway. Yeah, I think the uh, other aspect of the, some of the chat uh, comments I'm seeing is that uh, the reimbursement from lab-based services, some of that was covering the cost of all the unreimbursed care that our practitioners are providing. So the question is, what do you do now if that revenue has dropped significantly? How do you continue to provide the, the same level of services that you're doing? And um, obviously our payer policy review committee and others are, are, are doing what we can. I think the uh, other larger organizations like the AMA um, need to also uh, look at extending the payments for telemedicine and so forth so that our revenue stream isn't threatened a few months from now. Um, but I think uh, the aspect of this that is in our control is where can we improve our efficiency? And uh, one of the things that we were doing uh, at, at one of my the facilities where I was working is group CPAP setups, where some of the education we provide that's repetitive um, can be done in a, in a group so that uh, you know, the same amount of work can get done in a much shorter period of time. Uh, so can that be done over telemedicine? And I don't know of any centers that are doing that. Um, but if patients are made aware that, hey, this is not a private situation, are you okay being in a, in a group? And just like we are now in a group, um, you know, an educator could, could get in and, uh, and support some of our patients. And then there are roles also for peer advocates and community uh, educators. Um, and they've been shown in, in other disease processes and chronic disease management to be an effective and efficient way of supporting you know, chronic care management. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to embrace some of those newer roles as well. Yes, it is a chronic disease, isn't it? We can't address it as an acute episode. We have to do it, see it as ongoing. And you think about the thousands you've studied and, and you've seen over your career, you, you, you get humbled by the fact that you don't know where they are and how they're doing. And when you look at the success and failure rates, and now we're phenotyping, we're looking at different ways to approach different processes of sleep disorder breathing and who should get what and where. Uh, and as you travel across the country, there's different problems in different places. And, uh, and that's the excitement, I think, of the field. It's still very new. We've reached the top of the hour, so it's just about time to bring this to a close. Uh, Dr. Guru Bhagavatul, I do want to just bring up one uh, issue. There's a few comments related to authorization and payment policies for hospitalized patients. Uh, is there an opportunity there for, for changes in these policies to improve patient care related to uh, sleep studies for hospitalized patients? Any thoughts on that subject? I think an inpatient setting is a great place to to capture uh, vulnerable patients and deliver care. Um, you know, you're avoiding them having to make a trip in to come into your center to get seen. Um, some inpatient services are actually being done virtually at some centers. Uh, so the evaluation can be done with the patient having a tablet in the room and a nurse assistant getting the patient set up. That might be much easier for some of our older people and, and those who have struggled with telemedicine technologies um, or an in-person visit in the hospital. So in our center, we do do portable testing on hospitalized patients and we get the ball rolling. And again, it, it, there is some data that shows that it can reduce readmission rates and perhaps even 30-day mortality. So it's definitely worth pursuing. It's another way to um, it, you know, to help get our patients plugged in and, and start the process. And it would be interesting if long term, if we could actually show that, it, that those patients adhere better to CPAP. So similar to starting steroid inhalers on a patient who's hospitalized for asthma, uh, the message that the patient goes home with is very different. So if, if there's a prescription that's offered at the time of a hospital discharge, the way it's perceived by the parent, patient may be very different than during a routine outpatient visit. So, um, yeah, I think that's a great idea. 
Well, Dr. Amar, I'll turn it over to you for your closing thoughts as you look ahead. I know uh, this issue continues to be top of mind for you and for the board of directors that you're continuing to look for new opportunities to provide relief and assistance for our members. Uh, so, so what is on your mind as you look ahead to the next few months? Thank you, Thomas. Um, and first of all, I, I really want to thank our uh, panelists, both Dr. Spears uh, and Dr. Guru Bhagavatala for being on this call and, um, uh, and answering some of the qu questions and concerns raised by our members. So really appreciate you being on this call. A special thanks to also Thomas and, uh, and Kathleen, along with Mike and other um, staff who uh, wonderfully put this uh, thing together at the last minute, basically, uh, and, and, um, and, and providing this opportunity to hear directly from our members. So uh, thank you to the staff related to that too. And I also I, I want to thank uh, Mr. Steve Van Hout, who's our um, executive director, and of course the board uh, and my colleagues and, uh, and my friends on the, uh, the board of directors who are constantly, as you rightly point out, Thomas, thinking about what is it that we can be doing to help our members during this current particular situation. Um, uh, of course, we have a lot of ideas. Uh, we have a lot of thoughts. Uh, and as we continue to uh, finalize and or formulate these ideas and thoughts into some actionable items in the near future, that's where I really think we need to hear from our members because what we come up with needs to make sure it's addressing the gaps that the members are facing. Uh, and if they are not necessarily completely aligned, then whatever we are putting forth from an effort perspective may not have the impact that the members are looking for. So unless we hear more from members in terms of what is it that we can be doing, and, and this forum has definitely served that purpose a little bit, but I, I would love to see this extend even more, um, whether it's, uh, of course, if the members feel that this forum is helpful to the point we need more of these, uh, I think happy to uh, look into that. But also in the meantime, if uh, sending me an email at kramar at asm.org, or whether it's uh, contacting any of our staff at the AASM to voice their concerns, issues, and the initiatives that we could be taking will be hugely helpful as we formulate and finalize some of these next actionable items to benefit our members, our field, and of course, our patients at the end of the day, uh, that they get the best quality care possible uh, to help, and, and that we are in a position to help them in that regards. I'll also end up by saying this, uh, I, I think we are all in this together. I think uh, some of us, of course, are more affected than others, uh, but we are all in this together, trying to figure out best ways to work together, collaborate, uh, learn from each other, share best practices as we look at ways to navigate and overcome some of the barriers that we are all facing uh, during this particular current pandemic. And knowing that this is not something, uh, knowing that the pandemic is not anytime going away, I, I think this, I would rather, the, rather than looking at this as an obstacle, I think this is a, a, an opportunity for us to look at it differently and as uh, the panelists uh, at the later part of this forum pointed out, I think being adaptable, nimble, but at the same time um, working as a team and looking at ways to work differently so that when we look back, we can say that we overcome a big obstacle by doing some of these uh, traits that we inculcated uh, that our practice is a lot better than what it was pre-pandemic is going to be very important. So I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave us with saying that um, please continue to bring forth your questions, comments, concerns. I know some of them haven't been necessarily answered, but uh, I'm pretty sure we'll get back to them related to these questions that are unanswered on the chat or the question box. But definitely bring forth more, uh, more of these and we'll love to continue to hear from you as we continue to finalize our uh, actionable item plans uh, for what is it that we can do from the ASM for our members, uh, but also at the same time looking at opportunities that you can work differently uh, in a way that would uh, set a different direction than what, what's been done in the pre-pandemic, because that, that's exactly what's going to happen moving forward, and we might as well start that right now, using this as a stepping stone to look at things and working things differently than what we've done before. So with that, uh, again, really appreciate you all being on this call. Uh, thank you again for taking the time. And 
and uh, again, we are all in this together. We'll, uh, we'll uh, one thing for sure I can say, we'll get, we'll get over it. We'll get through this successfully. And, uh, and I think as we all stay together and figure out, figure out ways, I think we can definitely overcome this. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Well, if we did not get Thanks to your question today, great questions. Yeah. we do encourage you to send your questions to us at COVID at AASM.org. I thank Dr. Omar, Dr. Guru Bhagavatula, and Dr. Spear for this timely presentation and discussion. As a reminder, the recording of this webinar will be made available as a free member resource on the Academy website at AASM.org. This concludes a presidential town hall forum presented by the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. Thank you so much for joining us.